welcome to Osteobytes. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we'll give a few seconds for everyone to get settled into our virtual room. My name is Christina Iptoma, and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dillon and Director of Scientific Programs at MIB Agents. And today on Osteobytes, we are joined by Dr. David Fryer from Children's Hospital Los Angeles, who will provide a review of hearing loss as a serious and permanent side effect caused by cisplatin chemotherapy, recent research regarding its prevention and its relevance for young people treated for osteosarcoma. Thank you so much, Dr. Fire, for joining us on Osteobytes today. We are thrilled to have you. And thank you also to Walker, our panelists today for joining us. A little bit more about our guest today. Dr. David Fire is professor of clinical pediatrics, medicine and population and public health sciences at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. And he currently serves as director of the survivorship and supportive care program in the Cancer and Blood Disease Institute at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And also as director of the cancer survivorship program and co-director of the adolescent and young adult cancer program, both at the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Fryer's clinical care and research are concentrated in cancer survivorship cancer control, supportive care, and AYA oncology with an interest in treatment-related toxicity, survivorship care transition, cancer care disparities, and patient-reported outcomes. He had the privilege of leading ACCL0431, a randomized children's oncology group study and pivotal trial leading to FDA approval, I think just in September of 2022, of sodium thiosulfate as the first proven agent to prevent cisplatin-induced hearing loss in young people treated for cancer. So really excited to hear about that um, from Dr. Fryer today. Um, just one announcement before we get started. Um, Factor is coming up soon. That is our annual osteosarcoma conference. It's going to be June 20th to 22nd in Cleveland this year at the newly renovated Hotel Cleveland. And Factor is really unique in that it brings together everyone in our osteosarcoma community clinicians, researchers, patients, caregivers, patient advocates, industry. And you will come to collaborate and you will leave re-energized and inspired. And we are opening up registration next week on Valentine's Day. And um, we will be offering a early bird discount on registration um, for the first few weeks. So um, keep an eye out for some news on that. And I will put some links um, in the chat with some more information about Factor. Walker, um, thank you so much for joining as our panelist today. Could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Walker. I'm uh, part of this year's MIB Junior Advisory Board. Uh, I'm really excited to hear about uh, the presentation today because back in 2019, I was treated with cis plans. So definitely interested to hear what Dr. Fryer has to say and you can take it from there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for the opportunity to be presenting here today, uh, you know, this group uh, has a larger than life reputation, even outside the osteosarcoma world. One of my uh, social workers here in survivorship at Children's Hospital had the uh, privilege of presenting at, I think, one of your live Southern California conferences, uh, you know, a few years ago, and she was right. just so impressed with uh, you know, the content of the rest of the conference, the speakers, uh, you know, the attendees and, and everything. And I know that uh, this is a, a mixed audience in the sense that we have both um, uh, medical folks, uh, advocates, uh, patients, and uh, everything in between, basic researchers, clinicians. So I've tried, I'm going to try to calibrate my message uh, to everybody and I hope that there'll be a little bit of something for everyone here. If not, uh, please feel free to zero in on whatever you're most interested in during the question and answer period. Great, thank you. I don't have any uh, relevant disclosures really. This is the outline that I'd like to follow, uh, which is um, uh, to give a little bit of background on uh, uh, the uh, I'm just going to get my pointer out here uh, on the problem of cisplatin-induced hearing loss, kind of get us all on the same page there. Uh, I'm going to spend a good amount of time focusing on the two clinical trials that led to approval of sodium thiosulfate, which is the agent that, you know, is now available to prevent hearing loss, uh, and then discuss its relevance for patients with um, cis, uh, 
with uh, osteosarcoma and, uh, and then talk a little bit about the future directions because sodium thiosulfate, as we knew would be the case is not the end of the story, but really just the beginning of the story in terms of pre preventing this problem. Uh, things that I won't be focusing on uh, as much here just due to limited time is doing a deep dive in hearing assessment in uh, children and teenagers, um, grading hearing loss, uh, doing uh, collecting patient reported outcomes, which I think is very important. Uh, the role of genetic risk and then other types of autotoxicities such as vestibular dysfunction. There just isn't time to cover all of that. And as I said, what I'm going to try to do uh, today is to have a thread throughout all of this of the relevance of, uh, of uh, cisplatin-induced hearing loss, sodium thiosulfate for patients who are treated for osteosarcoma. So with that said, uh, in terms of the clinical aspects, the things that I wanted to highlight here is that the factors that affect risk are young age, although it does occur in all age groups, including teenagers, uh, higher cisplatin doses, beginning at a threshold of about 200 milligrams per meter squared, and osteosarcoma treatment is quite a bit higher than that, as you probably know. Um, I'm going to pivot over here to, to say that the type of hearing loss is what we call sensory neural hearing loss. So there's actually damage to the neural uh, apparatus within the ear. It is irreversible, uh, as uh, Christina stated at the beginning. It does not, uh, you know, it, it's permanent. It is nearly always bilateral. Worsens with continued treatment, as you can see here, uh, as the doses uh, become higher, uh, the uh, uh, hearing loss uh, worsens, and then uh, it can still worsen after treatment. And then a, an underappreciated problem is the problem of tinnitus, which actually is, we have very little data about after cisplatin therapy, but it's actually a type of toxicity that tends to affect older patients and therefore might be relevant to osteosarcoma. Uh, as I mentioned, cisplatin causes dose-dependent damage to the hair cells. So uh, the neural apparatus is actually damaged and it begins at the base and uh, of the cochlea, which is where all the damage is done. And it, it affects principally the outer hair cells, which are involved in amplification of sound. Over here, you can see that cisplatin gains access to the cochlea through something called the stria vascularis. And here it concentrates and then causes damage to the organ of cordy, which is where the uh, hair cells are located. Um, that then pre prevents uh, sound from being transduced to neural impulses, which are then uh, conveyed to the brain by the cochlear nerve. And the damage caused by cisplatin is, ten we think, is uh, mediated by uh, elevated uh, reactive oxygen species. This is highly reactive tissue damaging uh, uh, molecules. Um, they're the same ones that actually cause chemotherapy in some cases to work. Uh, but there's also depletion of some of the normal uh, uh, buffering mechanisms within the ear like glutathione. Uh, and all of this happens, uh, we think mostly in the mitochondria. Uh, so it's, it's that cellular sort of damage that leads to the uh, dropout of these hair cells. And just to give a little visual here, you can see this is what an intact cochlea looks like, you know, very sort of rich and uh, luxurious in terms of the presence of these uh, hair cells. But over here, the damaged cochlea after cisplatin therapy, these are photomicrographs from animals, um, you know, show the, you know, the really the devastation that cisplatin causes. Uh, one important point is that cisplatin is detected in the plasma and in so, uh, uh, tissues uh, actually decades after treatment. This has been recently published, and as a heavy metal, I suppose it's maybe not so surprising, but um, it, uh, it just goes to show that, that uh, probably the long-term effects of cisplatin uh, are partly related to the fact that it is deposited in the body and actually is not excreted very well at all. Clinically, uh, the important things to point out here is that this is an audiogram which shows the uh, hearing thresholds that I mentioned before. They tend to affect the highest frequencies first. So at any given dose, these are the frequencies that are affected the most. And it sort of slopes through this so-called hearing banana, as the audiologists call it, which is the clinically relevant hearing space for those of us you know, human beings in everyday uh, 
um, uh, function. So you can sort of see here as this passes through, there are a number of phonemes or, uh, or, or uh, language uh, sounds that are important uh, that are affected here. And kind of notice the this di diagram shows the different sorts of um, uh, noises that we are, take for granted often in everyday life that can be affected by this. So even sort of at mid, you know, sort of what you'd consider to be mid-range loss between in the in the voice or in the human speech range of two thousand to four thousand hertz. At higher, you know, the things that are, that are going to be lost um, uh, if this becomes too severe, you may be able to hear some of these loudest sounds. But look at the things that are lost. I mean, the chirping of birds, ticking of a clock rustling of leaves um, and in soft voices, of course, you know, all those things that, that we take for granted every day that make, you know, living rich uh, through hearing. And those are the things that are affected. They really do impact quality of life. And, and they have lifelong impacts, as I said, because this is a permanent problem. You can see here the array of issues that are affected. I think, you know, for teenagers, I, I think that, uh, we, you know, we they're not developing at an earlier age, clearly. So speech impairment may not be as severe as it would be for a toddler being affected because teenagers already, you know, have, have speech. But some of these impacts on underemployment, social isolation, uh, excess medical costs related to needing hearing aids and then impacts on relationships and so forth are very, very profound for these, you know, for this age group. Uh, I'd like to say just a word <clears throat> or two about hearing monitoring and surveillance. Monitoring is what we call it when it's monitoring during treatment. Surveillance is looking for hearing loss as a long-term survivor after therapy. Um, there are several hearing grades that have used, and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds with this, but over the years, one of the things that's made hearing research challenging is that, that there are several different grading scales that are used. Recently, what's been settled on, I think, is the common currency in this field has been is the, what's so-called PSYOP grading system. We don't need to get into the details of that other than to say that the higher grades are more severe hearing. Grade zero is no hearing loss. And uh, this is now being used in really all settings. For surveillance, uh, there were in 2019 some guidelines published that help uh, clinicians know in the survivorship setting who needs surveillance and how often, uh, uh, what should be done with abnormal results and some of the knowledge gaps. Um, and over here for the monitoring, uh, this is a more recent publication, just, just put out actually a couple of years ago that to guide us in patients that are on therapy, how often they should be monitored. And you can kind of see here that by age group, there are these different uh, approaches used, uh, tympanometry, you know, probably many people have heard of, uh, sound, uh, standard pure tone audiometry, and so forth. Um, these are all in the realm of, of normal audio, audiology practice. And these are the guidelines for monitoring based on the dose uh, intensity of the therapy. And I wanted to just highlight here um, that the ranges of cisplatin cycle doses that are typically used for cisplatin, or excuse me, for osteosarcoma, Put it into the group here where the expert recommendations are to obtain an audiogram at baseline after uh, or prior to each cycle of cisplatin subsequently, uh, not in between, but for the cisplatin containing cycles and then at the end of therapy. So those are the current recommendations for monitoring while on treatment. And uh, uh, hopefully those will, will help detect it early uh, if it is developing. This is a recently published study that uh, summarizes uh, the prevalence of um, uh, cisplatin-induced hearing loss as a function of age up here and as a function of diagnosis in the lower panel here. You can kind of see that in pink are the proportion of patients at these different ages who have hearing loss if they're exposed to cisplatin. This is a multiple diagnosis, big cohort uh, study that was done. Um, and uh, you can see that it, it is highest in the toddler range, and it does slope off as patients get older when they're treated. Uh, but you can appreciate here, I think, that even teenagers have a, you know, have a, a rate that's on the order of 20% or, or higher, depending on the exact age. 
And then down here, osteosarcoma is this uh, bar here. Patients who have that clearly have a lower incidence of uh, hearing loss compared with uh, the patients with neuroblastoma or hepatoblastoma, mostly as a function of age because these patients tend to be very young. But uh, the prevalence is higher than it is, say, for germ cell tumor, which probably is a reflection of the way that the cisplatin uh, is delivered and the total doses. Uh, this study identified a number of interesting uh, co, uh, more co cofactors, if you will, or covariates that cause hearing loss. And I thought I'd just mention a couple of them here. Some of them are a little bit surprising, like uh, the presence of vincristine, which is highly relevant for certain cancers, maybe not so much uh, osteosarcoma, but we were a bit surprised. Uh, carboplatin, especially when it's given very high doses. And then, of course, down here, we've known about this dose threshold of about of above 200, especially about 400 milligrams per meter squared as a cumulative dose is, is a high risk uh, uh, factor. Uh, but there were some other things here found like the, uh, the increasing dose per cycle of chemotherapy, increasing dose per daily dose when it's given as a fractionated one over a few days, and then even the rate of uh, cisplatin administration. These are details that, that aren't going to come into play so much in deciding individual treatment for patients, but from a research perspective, these are really important and they can help us with tr planning treatment regimens in the future, trying to reduce um, ototoxicity. Um, this study here, I, I in particular wanted to show because it, it, it's a little bit older, it's 2009, but it shed some real imp important light on the fractionation of cisplatin doses. And uh, uh, this was published from uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, looking at a cohort of patients that were treated in 1995 to 2004, ranging from three to 18 years of age. Now, importantly, none of these patients had cranial radiation, which is sometimes a confounder with our studies that involve brain tumor patients, but they had had no prior therapy. They had normal baseline hearing. And uh, the goal of this was to characterize the cumulative incidence of hearing loss in this cohort of patients with osteosarcoma specifically, and then to compare the hearing loss that was seen with a single daily dose of 120 milligrams per meter squared with patients who received a split dose where it was fractionated over two days at 60 milligrams per meter squared each day. <clears throat> uh, this is a summary of the uh, uh, patient uh, experience. And uh, to just highlight a couple of the major points, about 40% of their patients actually did develop hearing loss. Um, there were 36 total, and out of uh, those patients, 15 developed hearing loss. And as expected, there was a relationship with the total amount of cisplatin that uh, patients received when they received the highest amount of uh, as, as expected, uh, they had a very high proportion had hearing loss, uh, actually. Um, this shows the time to onset of hearing loss so that you can see that it, it increases with further doses of, of cisplatin. Again, that's known information, but if, if we have to keep on treating patients and they're already developing hearing loss, we can expect that it will probably get worse. Uh, and then very importantly and, and very interestingly uh, is that it was the incidence of hearing loss was dramatically lower when patients actually uh, received that cisplatin over the uh, fractionated two days. You can see here that for those patients who had no hearing loss, 90% uh, had gotten that uh, fractionated um, uh, dosing. So, you know, it, it really did protect hearing in a major way. And that's been translated into modern clinical studies. There are, there are obviously people on this call who are true experts in osteosarcoma, unlike myself, and might want to comment on that more. But I think that has worked its way into standard therapy or standard approaches, largely because of this important study. Uh, and so just to kind of wrap up a few things about that background and how it applies to cisplatin-induced hearing loss. So again, the incidence of <clears throat> primary and, so, and uh, of, of osteosarcoma uh, does peak sort of during this uh, uh, teenage uh, period here. But as you can clearly see, there is a portion, a proportion of patients, you know, who are who are you who are young. These are five to ten year or zero to ten years of age, and this does occur in younger patients. So that is impo something important to kind of keep in mind. 
The other thing is that cisplatin is remains part of, and as far as I know, for the likely foreseeable future, uh, it will probably continue to be a mainstay of the MAP type regimen for um, treating um, osteosarcoma, highly effective. And so I think we can expect to see that patients uh, who are both younger and also the more frequent older patients will continue to develop uh, cisplatin-induced hearing loss as a result of this. And many of them are patients who end up needing hearing assistance uh, in the future, and it does impact uh, their, their daily lives. So with that, I'm gonna pivot uh, over to uh, speak a little bit about these two studies that I referred to earlier of sodium thiosulfate. Uh, I won't go into great detail with this, but this is an oxidizing, uh, an antioxidant rather, a reducing agent that uh, scavenges the uh, uh, reactive oxygen species that are produced by cisplatin, uh, as I mentioned before. And it has, uh, it's, it was commercially available previously, prior to its indication by the FDA for hearing loss, it was previously available as an antidote for cyanide poisoning. It is actually still used uh, for that purpose uh, uh, today. Um, I'm going to show one uh, basic science uh, slide, if I may, here, which just makes uh, a couple of points, and I'll uh, just briefly describe this. So this is a, uh, a very important uh, uh, mouse model experiment that was conducted a number of years ago now as STS was being considered for clinical use. This is an agent where we know that if the drug is given with the cisplatin simultaneously, um, into animals, it will prevent the cisplatin from doing its job. It binds the cisplatin actually and, and uh, very much interferes with the chemotherapy. But if there's a time frame, uh, a separation where the cisplatin is given first and then the sodium thiosulfate is given later uh, after a period of uh, six hours, uh, it's actually four to eight hours, but six hours is what we use clinically, uh, we do not see that effect. And so what this shows uh, here, this slide, is that um, when uh, the uh, um, uh, cisplatin uh, is given uh, to, to patients uh, where uh, uh, they get the cisplatin and the so sodium thiosulfate uh, together. You can see that the, the cisplatin is inactivated, essentially. The tumors grow at the same rate that the black line does, which is, which is rapid growth of the tumor. But when the sodium thiosulfate is delayed uh, down here, as you can see by six hours, then the tumor growth that occurs is just like it is with cisplatin given alone. So that separation is key. And that was translated into the way that sodium thiosulfate is given now. So some of the considerations, uh, if there were to be an interaction in the clinical you know, world, what would we be thinking about? Well, there are many things that are reassuring from this standpoint. These things were all taken into consideration when the original concept was floated and the studies were designed. First of all, uh, the pharmacokinetics of free or unbound cisplatin are such that the drug is in the um, circulation for a very short period of time in its unbound form. And in the unbound form, that is not bound to protein, so to speak, uh, that is the active uh, uh, moiety, and that's what actually causes the cytotoxicity of the uh, chemotherapy. So free unbound cisplatin is available in the circulation for a very short period of time. Uh, along with this, the pharmacokinetics of sodium thiosulfate are also very short. The plasma half-life is on the same order of uh, 30 minutes or less, and it's mostly extracellular. So therefore, if there's a separation of six hours or so that uh, between the cisplatin and the STS, the free cisplatin that's unbound should be uh, gone and uh, cleared. Whatever is, is, is still in the circulation is protein bound at that point. And also it would mean that the STS then would not be interfering with that. And then in addition in multi-day regimens uh, and some tumors are treated say with four or five day courses, uh, cycles of cisplatin where it's given every day for four or five days, the STS would not be present with cisplatin if it's given every 24 hours. 
So with that uh, as background, I'll summarize quickly the uh, ACCL 0431 study. I, I'll, I'll try to hit the high points here that are important for understanding the data. These were patients 1 to 18 years of age who had any type of cancer that was treated with cisplatin, including osteosarcoma, but not limited to that. They needed to be getting enough cisplatin that we knew that they were likely to develop ototoxicity and they had to have normal hearing at baseline. The primary outcome for the study was hearing outcomes. Uh, everything was uh, calculated around that, including the powering of the study and the sample sizes. It was all around the primary outcome of hearing loss. Um, we used a type of uh, criterion that we don't use currently. As I said, the PSYOP criteria have, have sort of replaced the what we call ASHA criteria, but at that time they were the most sensitive criteria uh, that uh, uh, existed and so therefore they were used. Uh, the secondary endpoint sort of focused on monitoring event free and overall survival. And I say monitoring because this really was a more informal type of process because, as I said, the study was not powered around that endpoint. The sample size was determined all around the hearing endpoint, and we, you know, did the best that we could given that sample size to monitor this uh, important uh, secondary outcome. This was the schema of the study where patients, all they had to do was to be treated with cisplatin. They could get whatever regimen they were planning on, and then they were randomized over that to either get STS or to remain on observation. And their treatment was whatever it would have been, except cisplatin or STS was in integrated into it to be given as a single dose after each day of cisplatin. Each each dose, each time cisplatin was given, this was given exactly six hours later. And the primary endpoint uh, for this study was uh, hearing status at four weeks after all cisplatin was completed. These are the characteristics of the patients. Uh, there were 125 uh, patients who were eligible and uh, randomized, pretty balanced between STS and uh, observation. You can kind of see that, again, age, sex, race were all, you know, quite well uh, balanced. These were the this was the distribution by diagnosis. Uh, the most frequent cancer that was enrolled on this, the cancer type was germ cell tumor, but right up there was osteosarcoma. Um, and uh, that accounted for almost a quarter uh, of our patients. Uh, we later, as I'll explain later, we went back actually after the study was completed and uh, assessed uh, the extent of disease. And I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, later, but the distribution of patients with either localized tumors or metastatic or disseminated tumors was roughly, um, you know, roughly the same on uh, both sides. All patients uh, got very high doses of uh, cisplatin. And these are the results uh, by the randomized arm. So you can see here that uh, in the observation arm, a little over half of the patients developed hearing loss. Um, so this would be cisplatin only, and that was cut in uh, approximately in half uh, by the administration of sodium thiosulfate, uh, such that the adjusted risk for he developing hearing loss in the STS group was about 70% less actually as a result of receiving sodium thiosulfate. And when we when we sort of stratified that by age, uh, looking at patients under the age of five and over the age of five, we saw the effect in both ages, but it was particularly uh, impactful in very young patients where the baseline incidence of hearing loss was much higher, about 70%, and was reduced to about 20%. For the older patients, it was uh, the baseline incidence was a little bit lower, and the magnitude of the improve or the protection was a little bit less, but it was present in all age groups. Importantly, we, as I said, we monitored event-free as survival and overall survival. These are those curves uh, based on the 125 patients who were enrolled and randomized. This is the study cohort as a whole, everybody lumped together. Uh, the, up here, we have event-free survival, down here, overall survival. As you can see, there was no statistical difference 
uh, in either event-free survival or overall survival. Uh, however, when we analyzed the data, we were faced with a decision about whether to simply look the other way and kind of ignore this and uh, because it didn't reach statistical significance. But we decided that in order to have this be more useful clinically, that we wanted to try to uh, plumb the study for whatever you know useful information we could give that might you know might enlighten us further about uh, what is or wasn't going on at, at that uh, in that group of, uh, or you know in that in that finding that I just showed. So what we did was we retrospectively queried the institutions to go back and simply. Uh, this was after the study was completed to go back and classify their patients as e either having localized disease or uh, non-localized, disseminated, metastatic, whatever you want to call it. Um, we did not centrally review this. We did not have the studies to, you know, validate it. Uh, and uh, this was simply by institution report. So with all the limitations that that, that, that carries with it, uh, you know, we, we have the following data that I'll show you now. So for the patients who are retrospectively classified as having localized disease, um, we looked at event-free survival on the left, overall survival on the right, and as you can see, they, they really were no, no different uh, at all. When we then looked at the patients who were retrospectively uh, classified as um, having had uh, non-localized disease or disseminated, we were calling it at that time, uh, you can see that there was not a statistical difference for uh, event-free survival, but for overall survival, uh, there was. And so, you know, this is what we published was, was this, and we've been uh, rightly and, and roundly critiqued uh, about the idea of going back to, you know, do a post hoc analysis of this nature, but we were limited by the data that we had and we did the best that we could to, you know, try to elucidate what was happening. So in terms of explanations for this apparently lower, lower all, overall survival in uh, the STS patients, uh, here's uh, who had disseminated disease. Here's what you know, some possible explanations are. We think this is probably most likely to be the case that the randomization was unbalanced. This is a relatively small cohort. 120 patients, not thousands of patients. And there are many things that we did not collect about this cohort that were not accounted for. They were not stratified by the tumor type or extent of disease. Uh, there are risk groups, biological risk groups, you know, within each tumor type that were not assigned, biology factors that were not captured as part of our analysis, and we didn't quantify the burden of metastatic disease. You know, was it one pulmonary nodule or was it extensive? And it's also possible that the post hoc classification by the institutions was not, you know, accurate. We we didn't uh, uh, we were not in a position to be able to centrally uh, validate that. And it's also, in theory, possible that there was combined circulating STS and free circulating cisplatin, but we don't think that's the case for the uh, theoretical reasons I gave you earlier. But we also actually explored that post hoc uh, informally, and we found no evidence of that uh, at all, that the STS had been given earlier, for example, than specified by the protocol. The compliance was, was really quite good. So we think that with this, the most plausible explanation actually is, is highlighted here. In our statistical plan for the study, we expected that long-term survival, so pooled for all the cancers together beyond three years in the observation group should be about 48%. And we also, from the literature, when we go back and look at five-year overall survival in patients with disseminated disease across the different tumor types that were on this study, we would expect a five-year event uh, overall survival of about 50%. So these are pretty similar. What we actually found, though, was in our patients with uh, disseminated disease in the uh, observation group that their uh, uh, you know, uh, long-term survival was much higher. It was like 77%. Uh, and whereas the patients with the STS group, it was 48%. This really kind of doesn't make sense. The STS group is down where we would have expected the patients to be. And so we think that probably what happened um, is that there are some patients who ended up in the observation uh, or, uh, you know, group who are, uh, you know, better prognosis, so to speak, even though they 
you know, had disseminated disease and on the STS side, uh, it's a little bit more typical and what was expected. But we really have no way of sorting this out completely. And so uh, we're, you know, we're limited to the data we have and that did influence the FDA approval that I'll be describing uh, in a couple of minutes. Very quickly, uh, I mentioned the PSYOP scale, you know, the original 0431 study was done with the uh, with the ASHA scale, but now the PSYOP scale is widely used. We went back, actually and did a, a secondary analysis of the hearing outcomes using the PSYOP scale, and indeed uh, it holds true with that as well. So with the most current uh, uh, you know, grading system that's used, uh, the results of ACCL0431 uh, are, are still consistent. Pivot real quickly to the um, study, the other pivotal study for uh, this uh, uh, agent, uh, which is Cyopel 6 This is for hepatoblastoma only. This was conducted internationally, uh, again, limited to hepatoblastoma, unlike the COG trial, which was multiple diagnoses. This was also a randomized clinical trial where all patients received cisplatin and half of them received the STS in the same uh, manner that it was given in the other study uh, for all practical purposes. Uh, the primary outcome and secondary outcomes were actually the same. So these patients are much, much younger than the other patients. These are uh, 13 months median, which is typical for osteosarcoma. And these are the out uh, outcomes on Cyopel 6 very, very similar to what we saw with uh, 0431. About 60% of these uh, young children uh, baseline had hearing loss, those who received no STS, and that was cut in about half uh, for patients who received uh, the STS. And this just shows that by Brock uh, grading system, uh, the patients who received the uh, sodium thiosulfate, a much higher proportion of them had no hearing loss at all. Event-free survival and overall survival in this group of patients was exactly the same. So the combined conclusions that we drew from these studies is that STS definitively protects against cisplatin-induced hearing loss. Uh, that it does not reduce survival in standard risk hepatoblastoma or other localized cancers. And in metastatic cancers, we just can't be sure. We don't have conclusive evidence that STS lowers survival, but we can't sort it out with the data that we have, and it's going to require carefully designed prospective trials to really get at the bottom of that. So ultimately, uh, all these factors were considered uh, and the FDA approved sodium thiosulfate uh, to prevent hearing loss caused by cisplatin uh, in uh, children with non-metastatic solid tumors. Uh, there are prescribing information that are available you know, through the FDA. Uh, the trademark uh, name for this is PEDMARC. That's the formulation that was uh, uh, approved by uh, the FDA. And uh, that is the one that's recommended uh, for use. And I just wanted to mention that recently, the uh, most recent version of the Adolescent Young Adult Oncology uh, Guidelines uh, published by the NCCN, the National uh, Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, included uh, a discussion about uh, the use of sodium thiosulfate in uh, teenagers who were receiving cisplatin. And so I'm going to just uh, kind of spend the last few minutes here talking about cisplatin and preventing uh, the problem of uh, cisplatin-induced hearing loss in the clinical setting. And I wanted to focus specifically on osteogenic sarcoma, kind of draw all this, you know, to, to relevance here. So again, not saying anything that folks on this, on this uh, call don't already know, but to highlight them for the purposes of this discussion. Osteosarcoma is a tumor that clearly more often affects adolescents and young adults, but it does also affect younger children. It's important to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, the regimens that are used for this, uh, to the best of my knowledge, again, I'm not an osteosarcoma expert, but uh, you know, in my knowledge of the field from the perspective of hearing loss uh, is that cumulative higher, higher cumulative doses of cisplatin are typically used. So this is well into the range that, you know, that commonly causes hearing loss, especially in, old, in younger children, but also older patients may be affected. Uh, the individual cycle doses are relatively high, uh, fractionated by two days, which, which does help, but still the individual cycle dose is high. 
And, uh, and overall, as I showed you previously, uh, about 25% of patients in aggregate treated with uh, cisplatin and not receiving any odor protection, about 25% will develop clinically significant hearing loss. So I think a, a way to sort of approach uh, offering sodium thiosulfate uh, to the patients who have osteosarcoma, first of all, remember that we're talking about localized disease here. Metastatic disease needs further study. Uh, we, it's just an open question, but it needs to be studied further in, you know, in appropriate uh, randomized controlled trials that we just don't have at this time. So we're limiting the discussion more or less to localized disease, remembering that it is FDA approved. So therefore it's commercially available for all patients. In terms of individual patients, I think some of the things that can, you know, sort of be brought up in this conversation, if, if there are questions, is that, uh, yes, there are some potential infusion-related side effects uh, that may affect older patients more often than younger, in my experience, clinically, and maybe we can talk about some of that in the discussion. But I like to kind of keep in mind and remind families if they're, you know, wondering about that or if they have one course that maybe goes a little rough with the first dose of STS and we need to, you know, sort of manage the subsequent ones later is that this is a transient problem. Uh, not to say that it's um, trivial or, or that we're, you know, uh, not, uh, you know, concerned about having our patients be comfortable, but it is transient, unlike hearing loss, which is permanent. And, and we can do some things to make the infusion-related side effects probably a little bit better. Again, things that are good about preventing cisplatin-induced hearing loss is that it's irreversible. It can affect, um, uh, you know, clinical uh, status and daily function and uh, quality of life in a major way. It also might allow cisplatin dose intensity to be maintained. You know, most many uh, clinical approaches to using cisplatin are without autoprotection is that if we start to see hearing loss, we have to start reducing or, or withholding doses of cisplatin and we don't know, you know, fully what that if that compromises treatment or not. So to the extent that uh, sodium thiosulfate might allow us to preserve dose intensity of the platinum, perhaps it helps maintain the integrity of the protocol. Um, understanding what the patient's values and preferences are, are very important, I think are very important. You know, these are old enough, these are patients old enough to, to express their own opinions. And, you know, if hearing is something that's important for them, then you know, by all means, we, we need to try to honor that since we have an agent that can help. And I think another factor that um, can sometimes uh, come to bear in some patients is do they already have some sort of, sort of comorbidity as far as their hearing goes, congenital hearing loss, or maybe blindness or other neurosensory, uh, you know, deficits where the loss of another, uh, you know, uh, organ system, another sensory system, you know, could be could be very devastating. This tends to be a problem, I think, more in younger patients with brain tumors and such, but I mention it here because it's possible something like that could come to come into play. So uh, with that, uh, I'm just going to say a couple last slides here about, uh, you know, where we're headed from a, you know, from a research perspective and uh, hopefully to increase the number of options that are available in the years ahead for preventing hearing loss now that we know that it can be done um, is uh, just an interesting research question that uh, is interesting to me as somebody who works in this uh, space, which is that now that we have an agent, uh, sodium thiosulfate, that is the standard of care for localized disease, you know, that now is going to influence the design of all of our trials. So prior, prior to that, all of the studies were just using observation as the control. And it's just something interesting for us to be thinking about is that it raises the bar now. Every future agent that we're testing, we're actually not going to be comparing it to observation, but to the baseline uh, control that we can get from STS. So it, it does raise the bar to some extent, and it's something that we need to keep in mind as we design our trials. There is currently an, a COG study, ACNS 2031, which is studying STS to reduce cisplatin-induced hearing loss in average and low-risk medulloblastoma. I won't go into this in, in detail, but I mostly wanted to share with the group that, uh, you know, that this is, uh, this is uh, currently running. And uh, uh, 
patients uh, are, are being enrolled uh, on this uh, study. And this will be, this is a non-randomized study that will be comparing the uh, uh, control uh, and the incidence of hearing loss in this study cohort with historical cohorts where we know that the uh, prevalence of hearing loss is very high in this, in this uh, particular population of patients. Uh, there are some other agents that are starting to percolate up uh, that are uh, very interesting. Uh, Dibrafenib, uh, BRAF and CRAF inhibitor, atorvastatin, probably heard of as a cholesterol reducing agent. Uh, there's an antioxidant named Epsilon. Uh, these are oral agents, which is uh, interesting. And uh, uh, the, none of these are really ready for clinical trials yet. They're still in animal models, but uh, uh, clinical, actually atorvastatin, I take that back, was uh, a trial was just opened at NIH for adults with head and neck cancer receiving cisplatin. So that that is one human trial that's going on with these agents. But otherwise, these are sort of in the animal models, but looking very encouraging. And we're hoping that some of these will be translated into uh, human trials soon. I did want to mention uh, the issue of intratympanic injection, you know, more for interest. So this is taking advantage of the idea that if you could inject uh, an anti- uh, or a notoprotectant into the middle ear through the eardrum so that it goes, so that it, it migrates through the round window into the cochlea to protect the hearing apparatus there, that that would be a way of sort of keeping your otoprotectant uh, anatomically localized, so to speak. Um, we tested, we had the opportunity to be part of a small clinical trial led here at CHLA uh, that was sponsored by a pharma company in uh, San Diego, actually, that uh, has a, a research uh, pipeline of agents uh, to designed to, you know, to protect uh, hearing, not just in the chemotherapy standpoint, but also for treating otitis media and things like that. Anyway, they have this platform of a dexamethasone containing agent. And it's very interesting. It's a, it's a, a gel form where it's, it's liquid at room temperature. And then once it's injected into the middle ear and reaches body temperature, it sort of becomes a gel form. So it holds it up in that space and then allows the dexamethasone, which was the active agent, to sort of uh, migrate into the middle ear. And uh, it was interesting because uh, they had good animal data to show that dexamethasone actually prevented uh, hearing loss in uh, rats who were exposed to cisplatin. So we uh, put together with them a small clinical trial and treated 11 patients, 18 courses of uh, chemotherapy. And the goal of this was uh, really to um, prove the feasibility and safety of doing this. And I think this study clearly demonstrated that, that this was something even in very young patients that we could do working with ENT to administer a dose of this, one single dose of it before each platinum course. So I think it's a good approach. It turned out that the de dexamethasone uh, you know, did not give us the protection that we were looking for. There were some differences between the animal models and the human models that I think account for that. But I think we were really encouraged to see that this approach, I think, is, is one that could be explored, you know, further in the future. So with that, uh, I'd like to leave some time here for discussion and uh, questions. And uh, before going there, just to acknowledge, um, you know, all the many people who have been part of uh, you know, getting to where we are with auto protection now, especially the children and the families who have been part of these trials. And uh, I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. And I wanted to turn it back over uh, to Walker and to Christina. Thanks so much, Dr. Fryer. Um, such good information. Um, and uh, anyone, if you have questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A. Um, but just thought I'd start with a couple. So um, some really interesting data you presented in the beginning about um, just how even without the sodium phensulfate, there were kind of a few things like the rate of infusion or even fractionating the dosing over a couple days that could um, help prevent the incidence of hearing loss. And um, curious if that uh, has been translated at all to clinical practice, just, just in changing the way that the cisplatin is administered. Yeah, um, it hasn't been translated yet because the you know new trials haven't really been designed since that was published. That was published really just a couple of years ago, and so um, you know this information is 
is out there now, and I think it can start to be incorporated in the design of new trials, though, for sure. So I think um, I, I think it it is highly relevant clinically, and I think it will find its way into the way that cisplatin is administered. Uh, but most regimens that are being used right now, you know, have been in use for quite a while, and they were already, you know, sort of established. But I, I did want to, you know, really give a shout out, I think, to the osteosarcoma community. I, th I think that that trial, I really made a point of including that study in this presentation, the one from, you know, Dana Farber published by some real giants in osteosarcoma, actually, um, you know, that showed that there was a dramatic drop in the frequency of cisplatin induced hearing loss when it was fractionated over two days for, you know, as opposed to one day. I mean, may, maybe by today's standards, you know, we, that seems like old news. Well, you know, at the time it wasn't old news. It was, it was, you know, really quite a novel and important observation. And I, and I, to the best of my knowledge, it actually did get translated into, you know, the way that platinum is given, you know, to osteosarcoma patients. And that's to the credit, I think, of, of the people who are, you know, leading the research in this field. And um, you'd mentioned, so it's it's uh, FDA approved. And I think in one of the slides you had mentioned it was for localized disease as opposed to metastatic disease. So I just wanted to clarify for, because, you know, MAP, an osteosarcoma MAP is given at, you know, initial diagnosis. And um, if someone presented with both local and metastatic disease um, while getting MAP, would this not be recommended for that or? Well, uh you pull me back if I'm not answering your question, Christina, but I think uh, for patients, uh, the way that, you know, the FDA availability, you know, the approval would apply to osteosarcoma patients would be a newly diagnosed patient who has localized disease would be able to receive this right from the beginning. Um, you know, the idea would be to try to prevent, you know, hearing loss from developing uh, at all, if possible. Um, for patients who presented with metastatic disease at diagnosis, um, we would recommend not using it at this time. We just don't feel that the, you know, that the, um, uh, the evidence, you know, the, the data, we're not comfortable recommending it, you know, kind of for all patients. We are comfortable recommend, recommending it for localized disease, but for metastatic, we, we think that more research needs to be done to you know, to really sort sort that out. We those of us who have looked at the data very closely and looked at it every which way, you know, um, and and you know, all of the pharmacokinetics of the drugs and everything. Like I said, you know, I I, I think in our heart of hearts, we we sort of think that uh, there are probably some alternate explanations for that unfortunate, uh, you know, outcome. But that you know that. Are alter there are explanations other than it actually interfering with the chemotherapy, but um, the data are, are what they are, and we have to just respect that and and find a way to produce data that can refute that. I have a I have one question. So you may have already said this, and apologies if you did, but I was just curious on what are the different side effects of STS. Uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, so, sodium. Uh, so for sodium, sodium thiosulfate, uh, as far as we know, doesn't have any long-term side effects. Uh, Short-term are sort of during the infusion. I think that's what you know. Most people have have uh, you know that's what the clinical experience is. So uh, it's not a real high percentage in my clinical experience. I think older patients are a little more prone to this, but the main thing it's an infusion reagent, reagent, uh, excuse me, infusion uh, mediated reaction or infusion related reaction. What do we mean by that, Walker, is that it's not a true allergy. Okay, when a person has a drug allergy, you know they may develop hives and have trouble breathing and all of that, and that can be with any drug, even at tiny doses and slow rates and so forth. Um, with this, it's not an allergy for you know these patients, but what it is is it's the infusion itself, you know, the rate of it. This is a drug that um, needs to be given over 15 minutes. So it's a fairly sh you know, short infusion because we want to get it in and get the plasma level of it up you know, high quickly. So it's given over a short period of time and, and over 15 minutes. 
Now, you know, there's a percentage, I, I think that overall, it's probably fewer than 10%, you know, overall, will have some infusion re re reactions, meaning some uh, uh, rigors, which is sort of a shaking, uh, nausea, I would say that's the most common would be nausea and vomiting and sort of intense, you know, vomiting. It, it happens almost predictably at the end of the 15 minute infusion, the person starts saying, oh, I feel sick to my stomach and they may throw up. And then, um, but it goes away fairly quickly within about 30 minutes or so, then, you know, the symptoms disappear. So it's kind of related, you know, to that infusion very much. Um, you know, for the nausea and vomiting for patients who have that, we have guidelines for, you know, using antiemetics, just like you would for chemotherapy. I think it helps some. It doesn't necessarily get rid of it completely. I think, you know, just like with chemotherapy, some people are more sensitive to it than others. And so if they've got that sensitivity, you know, it can, uh, it, you know, it'll help some, but maybe not, you know, make it go away completely. If they have the rigors, which is less common than the nausea and vomiting, that means, you know, sort of a shaking, shakiness. Um, you know, usually with subsequent doses, that is not as bad, but sometimes there are medications that can be given along with it that, you know, will help that. I think overall, you know, what is really important here is that it's like when we give chemotherapy all the time, you know, some of our patients don't tolerate it as well as other people do. And what we do is we we counsel our patients, you know, we try to sit down with them and say, um, you know, I'm so sorry that you feel so lousy, you know, let's try to fix some things so that it'll be better next time. And, you know, usually it is a little bit better, but, you know, you, you've got to support your patients and you have to talk to them and say, hey, you know, this is a short-term side effect and I'm really sorry you're having it, but let's kind of keep in mind that this is a temporary thing. We'll get through this and, you know, hopefully it'll preserve your hearing and that'll be your long-term benefit, you know, for this. Whereas the hearing loss, if we just give up and it, you know, it, it ends up happening, then uh, that's permanent and it'll never come back. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like a pretty good trade-off. I'd probably shake and vomit for a little bit. So that way I can hear. <laughs> yeah. Walker, did you experience any hearing loss? Uh, I don't know. I probably selective hearing, but I think uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't that's think that's a you know, associated thing, selective hearing. Yeah. yeah. No, I think <laughs> I got lucky yeah, on that. Maybe but. ask his parents or his partner or friends or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's part of like the cancer card that you get is like, yeah. hey, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, but overall, I don't think I've, I've really had much hearing loss. So definitely got lucky on that end. But I was also treated, I got it when I was like 15. So I was right in that good time frame where it seemed like at least the the study showed that I had pretty good odds of keeping my hearing. So and do you, do you mind my asking any ringing in your ears? Do you have any trouble with that at all? You know, maybe like every once in a while, like once a month. But I don't know if that's just like <clears throat> something that happens or if it's related to the chemo because it's not it's not very often. Yeah, some some people can have that uh, anyway, but. Uh, uh, that does that's a toxicity that we need to do a better job capturing because we know that cisplatin can cause that we don't know yet if sts prevents that but for some older patients like young adults when they're treated in their 20s and 30s that's their main side effect and, and it's quite bothersome for them if they yeah have. no i i don't i i wouldn't even like wouldn't ever think about it so no i think overall i got got pretty lucky with my hearing Uh, Dr. Fire, we're almost, we're pretty much at the top of the hour, but I had wanted to squeeze in one more question. Yes. Just people might be wondering. So I think the study was focused on pediatrics, 18 and under, I think. And so just as, in terms of application for adults and 18 plus, I you referenced a study, I think with carboplatin where STS helped minimize incidence of hearing loss, but um, I guess applicability for patients that are older. With, Less, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that it is. I think the FDA approval is for patients older than one month. Okay. So it doesn't say up to 18. You know, our study was, uh, we, we kept our study at 18, but I, I think if uh, there were, uh, you know, individuals interested in 
receiving it, you know, who are over that. I think if they talk with their oncologist, I don't think there's anything standing in the way of using it. We'd recommend, you know, just using the same approach that we would for somebody who is 17 or 18. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Farr, for joining us on Osteobites today and for making it better for AYA cancer patients. More information on this and all osteobites can be found on our website at mibages.org, on our YouTube channel, and at your favorite podcast place. And next Thursday, we're going to be dropping a new episode of our Osteo AYA podcast. Camille is going to be chatting with Dr. Abby Rosenberg, who is the Director of Palliative Care at Boston Children's Hospital and also Chief of Pediatric Palliative Care at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, about managing stress in AYA cancer patients. Um, and you can find the episode on our website um, and at your favorite podcast place and also on our YouTube channel next Thursday on the 15th. And then we'll be back with Osteobites on the following Thursday, February 22nd with another um, researcher from Dana-Farber, Dr. David Schulman. Um, he's a pediatric oncologist and he is gonna be joining us to talk about the LEOPARD study, uh, which stands for liquid biopsy in ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma as a prognostic and response diagnostic. So I hope you can join us for that. You can find our Osteobites lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for future topics you'd like to hear about, please feel free to email us at events at mibages.org. Thank you again so much, Dr. Fire, and for Walker for spending an hour with us today. And thanks to all of you. Um, and we hope to see you back here in a couple weeks on Osteobites on the 22nd when we talk with David uh, Schultz. Thanks so much to everyone.